May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be accepted in my sight, my Lord and Redeemer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it is, again, uh, tradition in uh, the Anglican Catholic faith is, is very important uh, because it keeps us constantly uh, the keel straight so that we get touch all that we need to touch, that we get to the end point that we need to get to. And we always, there is one homily or sermon during the four weeks leading up to uh, Christmas that always includes one phrase. And today, because we are so close, just so wonderfully close to the birth of Christ and the celebration of Christmas, I wanted to bring it to this day. It's St. John chapter 1, verse 23. Uh, again, uh, one of those things that if, if you have a place to put something on your refrigerator, this is the one to put there. Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. That sums up everything. Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. With these words, John the Baptist points, as Father has said, way beyond himself. They mistakenly thought that he was the Savior for quite a while. He kept pointing beyond himself to Jesus, who was to come to John in humility to be baptized. Think of that. Fully God, fully man, coming to a man to be baptized. That's humility and a masterful lesson for all of us in humility. God came to John in full humility as a man as well. Even though John has baptized Jesus, he knows Jesus to be far greater than he is. Quote, his shoes latcheth, I am not worthy to unloose. John does not become a disciple of, Christ, of Jesus. Remember, they kind of split apart at that point. You don't really hear much of John after that. He is later, because of his faith, and I wonder uh, if we're ready to do a lot of things for our faith. If you might remember, John was beheaded by Herod as a consequence of his own ministry, which denounced sin and preached the baptism of repentance. Think of that. Non-Christians do not believe in repentance. They believe in punishment. Beheading, control, power. That's a different concept. Just as a side note, I don't know if you saw the information that came out just yesterday. They have actually found, uh, of course, you know, the non-believers will tell you that this is, this is all myth. None of this really happened or the story is all distorted, etc. They actually found the, uh, the location where Herod um, had Salome dancing in front of him. They found that location. So they found Herod's small palace right there uh, in the location where he, it should be. I wonder when these folks will finally end up with all the facts being found and still deny what's going on. But they did find that. Jesus tells us that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Slap. <laughs> the, least in, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John yet. Yet, John is indispensable for the advent of that kingdom. What Jesus was saying was not a slap to John, but rather a statement of the glorious inclusion of everyone in the kingdom. He was basically saying, John is not as great as those in the kingdom of heaven, but guess what? He is part of the kingdom of heaven. He is part of my design, and so are you. John's virtue, one which we must all imitate, up to Herod, uh, is that he knew what he was not. Did you ever think about that? Sometimes it's difficult. Uh, you know people that will that'll pretty much tell you the things that they are, and you know doggone well that uh, there's a different story with all of that. Well, he knew what he was not, and he was honest about that. I am not him. I'm not him. If it is what he said, and thus knew what his soul needed from God. Those people that play at being something they are not do not actually know who they are. They are always trying to be somebody else. Reminds me of actors in Hollywood. But beyond that, there is an issue with that. His reply to the Jewish priests and Levites was totally negative. There was no question. 
There was no, oh, I'm, I'm really a cool guy. You know, Jesus is over here, but I'm his partner and, you know, that rubs off on me. He didn't do that. What did he say? Quote, I love this. Talk about brutal honesty. I am not the Christ. I mean, can you make any mistakes with that? And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elijah? And he said, I am not. Art thou the prophet? And he answered, no. He had just lowered himself to the lowest possible common denominator in front of these powerful people. How many of us are willing to do that? I mean, to speak the truth in front of power. He knew what he was not. He had no delusions. He had no delusions. He recognized that he was lacking and he was not afraid to let others see it. I love those people that I, I, I don't know how many people, you know, but I fall in love. I don't I mean that in a, uh, in a, in a brotherly way with, with either men or women. It doesn't matter when they actually tell you honestly who they are. I mean, their faults and their successes. I mean, that is just that's amazing to me that people do, are, do not feel vulnerable. Most likely those people have a strong inner core. Where does that inner core come from? Usually a Christian belief. God, after all, is greater than any of us. So why should we mess around in this world trying to make believe? He was an advent. Expectant was John. Hoping and longing for the coming of the power of God's kingdom. He was willing to let his need be known so that it could be supplied, so that he could be filled with a power and strength greater than his own. Today, uh, St. Paul rouses us both to rejoice in the coming of the Lord in Philippians 4, 6 by saying, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let our requests be made known unto God. Supplication, falling to your knees or in the Middle Ages, falling on your face. Uh, to the ground. Let us today, a week, just, well, actually less than a week before Christmas, learn this from John. What a great lesson just before Christmas from John to get yourself ready to accept Christ. If we are to know the coming of the Lord, we must, in fact, want him to come. I know it's cool. Christmas is really nice. Presents are really good. The purpose of Christmas is to want Christ to be with you and in you. We must prepare. We have one partial week left to prepare. We must know and acknowledge what we need and lack and have the humility. And that's, I'll tell you, that's hard for everybody. It's hard for me to pray for it. To actually pray for something that you know you lack. Most of us don't like to talk about those things. Well, at least admit it to yourself. I need to do the same thing. And pray to God with our whole being. If Christ, if Christ is to be born in us, there must be a place prepared for him, as scripture tells us. But how can we prepare a place? Why is there always a need and longing for God, a place only he can fill? Even in atheists, they always look for something to be, to be a God. They're wired to have a greater being than themselves. In their case, it might be government. It could be something else. But that becomes their God. But... St. John the Divine tells us that the Lamb of God to which the John the Baptist points is the quote, and I love this phrase as well because it's so true. He was at, in the beginning of Genesis, this is true, in Revelation 13, 8, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was to be slain even though he created that which was to kill him as the second person of the Trinity. God's Love for us was that great. Before we were even created, he was prepared to save us. That's amazing to me. It's just, I mean, who would do that except our God, Jesus Christ? God's love for us did not begin 2,000 years ago with the birth and eventual death of this innocent child. It is the eternal purpose of God to join mankind to him forever. It has always been the purpose from the very first, and I know I'm misspeaking here because there is no such thing if it's not yet created, instant of creation. He was prepared to die. 2,000 years ago was just the beginning of the consummation of that whole plan. 
So let's talk about billions and billions, as Carl Sagan would say, billions of years ago. It all began. It is the eternal purpose of God to join with us. This is the real eternal fact coming from Jesus reveals and makes known in time. Ephesians 1.4, very clear. God has chosen us in Christ. Is that not a cool statement? God has chosen us in Christ before. Now this is in Ephesians. Before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We weren't going to be around for billions of years and he already prepared to die. Is that not astounding? I mean, we're talking about a faith, a Christian faith that is all encompassing and has been forever. The eternal purpose and everlasting love of God is that men and women should enjoy that goodness forever. We, at least I think all of us do, long for and desire God. And cannot avoid this because he loves us and he wants us. We love him because what? He first loved us, as the phrase goes. Because he loves us, we find that all the elements of the world are untrue. A sham of what is real. It cannot in the end feed our hunger or quench our thirst. We seek true bread, true drink. The bread that comes from heaven and is born in Bethlehem. But this love of God is costly for him. It cost him everything. It didn't cost you anything. It cost him everything. We know the Lamb of God is innocent goodness, which takes away our sin and makes us acceptable in God's presence, must be murdered, must be destroyed because of what we have done. And he is willing to do that. For you and for me. Within the beauty and glory of Christmas, we find a stark and terrible truth. Christmas is identical to Good Friday. They come together. He was born to die. We don't talk about that around the Christmas tree. But he was born to die. An innocent child born to die. To die. We cannot know Jesus on Christmas unless we remember the blood of his passion and the thorns of his crown and the gall of his crucifixion. These are the high costs of the eternal love of God shown and adored in the baby. The same eternal will required the sacrifice of his son to pay for you and me. From eternity, the son shared God's love and undertook to pay the price. Hebrews 10, 7 and 9. Lo, it is written in the book. I come to do thy will, O God. Which is what he also said in the Garden of Gethsemane. Which is also what he reflected on the crucifix, the cross itself. The man to whom John Baptist points is the lamb killed from the very beginning of creation. The sacrifice comes to us in this season in the innocence and beauty and humility of a child. As I've said to you many times, God could have come to us as a 33-year-old man. He didn't have to come to us through Mary as a child. But he did. Why? Because he wanted to show that innocence had to be sacrificed on our behalf. Evil is a bad thing. He sacrificed all. Innocence and Good Friday go together. Remember, he was sinless. He was still, as he asks us to be, as a child, not childish, but as a child, sinless. He's kept his innocence all the way to the cross. The same sacrifice is made present here this morning on the altar. Think of it when we do, <laughs> we go through the canon of the mass. Eating the bread of eternal life and drinking the cup of everlasting salvation is Christmas, is Good Friday, is Easter, all in one action. This done, we, may we welcome him always. And welcoming him, may we make us worthy to sing the eternal praises of God who has always loved us way beyond our creation as an individual. Finally, let us complete. You have a few more days. <laughs> so do I. Let us complete final preparations. Preparations in our heart and in our soul. Preparations that will gladly, willingly, and totally Receive our Lord and Savior in the celebration 
the real celebration of Christmas. So I ask you, make your final preparations. Father, just again.